Hey, welcome back listeners around the world and of course to our good friends in the cosmos. I'll be your host for the next hour plus Ghost Man Shano, the best in the Midwest broadcasting live from the crossroads of America. This is your place for the strange, your shadow nation. What is going on guys? So good to see you. Hope it's good to see me. I'm back in studio and we're rolling we got a great guest tonight, a good friend of mine stopping by the show. And we're going to talk about a great topic, a great topic of ITC. And for you guys that don't know what that means, it's instrumental transcommunication, of course, electronic voice phenomena. You and the ghost hunting community, the uh, spirit research community will know those terms. Some of you will not. But tonight, after this interview, you'll be familiar with both. The world of instrumental transcommunication is something that's been studied since the invention of the phonograph. Uh, of course, the skeptics have tried and tried and tried to disprove it. Um, that's what they do, right? They claim raising the noise floor. Uh, they claim that the, the scientists will say it's auditory pareidolia. Uh, most times, even before they listen to the evidence or try it for themselves. Um, so there's just so many people out there that say this is false before it's even investigated or researched. You know, there needs to be time put into it. And tonight's guest is the man and all of us that are out there doing spirit research are the people that are putting in the time, putting in the hours, trying to find out if there really is something to spirit communication, which I believe 100% there is. I've seen too, I've heard too much, I've seen too much to not believe it's not true. So let's go over a little bit of history real quick before we bring in tonight's guest about ITC, Instrumental Transcommunication. Professor Ernest Sinkowski, he was a German physicist. William O'Neill, he, he ran the Skoll experiment. Konstantin Radiv in the 1970s popularized the idea of EVP. He described EVPs as typically brief one or two word responses. Thomas Edison, of course, in an interview from Scientific America, when asked the possibility of using his inventions to communicate with spirits, he replied, if spirits were only capable of subtle influences, a sensitive recording device would provide a better chance of spirit communication than the table tipping and Ouija boards mediums used at that time. Spiricom and Frank's Box. Now, this was a controversial one. Came out around 1980. Uh, William O'Neill made an electronic audio device uh, called Spiricom. Uh, it claimed he built the box uh, psychically from George Mueller, uh, the spirit of George Mueller, scientist who died six years earlier in Washington, D.C. press conference on April 6th, 1982, O'Neill said he was able to have two-way conversations with spirits through this device. Now, there's been claims that that one's been disproved. I don't know much about it. I'm still looking into it, but there was claims on that. In 1982, Sarah Estep, founded the American Association of Electronic Voice Phenomena, AAEVP. She claims to have hundreds of recordings from deceased friends, relatives, and even extraterrestrials. So some people claim we're not even dealing with the supernatural here, or we're not dealing with the spirits, that we're dealing with extraterrestrials. So as you guys can see, plenty of people have claimed to be working on this for a long time. There's a lot of interest in it. And of course, people want to know that there's something after life and that our dead ones just don't go to the ether and we can never hear from them again. But I think, I think there's a very real and strong possibility that this is actually happening, folks. And tonight's guest is going to tell us how. Tonight's guest proves that loss and love mixed with science and some help from the spirits can change the way the world looks at the afterlife. Ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome to the studio my dear friend, Gary Galka. Hey, Sean, how have you been? It's been a long time, long overdue, I got to tell you. It's been long overdue, and I, yeah. I was looking at the charts the other day. I think it's been almost eight years since I've had you on the show. 
Yeah, I knew it was a long time. I, I couldn't put a finger on it. I kept thinking to myself, when did I last see Sean and when did we last speak? But I do know that uh, I miss your your friendly way about you and uh, having a good conversation. That was a couple of things that I, I remember about you very distinctly. So it's right. nice to see you again. I appreciate that. Right. And I tell you what, the, the, uh, the amazing work that I've been watching you do on Twitter, um, uh, you know, I told you for years, uh, I compare you, uh, you're right up there with uh, Edison and Tesla, <laughs> in my opinion. And uh, it's I think the amazing story you have about one man's journey to create the most powerful devices today to communicate with the dead is uh, it falls right on your lap. That's you, brother. Mm. You know, I, I tell you, if, if somebody was to, you know, if I, we were just sitting casually someplace and just chit chatting, I never in my wildest dreams would would imagine that the path that I would be led down would be this one. I mean, this is the most unlikely path for me to to live my life. Right. Uh, you know, I mean, let's face it. It's not it's not ordinary by any extent, you know, of, of looking at things from what people are doing on a daily basis and how people normally live their lives. We're kind of like on the outer edges of of living a normal life you know because you've pretty much committed yourself to s certain things that that most people cannot relate to right you know what it's, i mean it's it's kind of crazy but i i've accepted that i mean the the things that have brought me to this point in my life i accept that you know i, I don't have any option but to look at life uh, from from a perspective of reality, and this is just the way my life is, and and I, I have to deal with it. So, and it in many ways, it's made me a much better person. You know, well, let's let's get into that because yeah. before I had you on the show, uh, I mean, last time you were on the show, we got into the tech parts, and I talked about, oh man, what's coming up and everything. And by the way, guys, I just wanted to tell everybody out in the Shadow Nation around the world, mm -hmm. Gary sent me sent me my very first mail meter just sent it to me out of the kindness of his heart and a ps uh, uh a uh, spirit box sp7 yeah sp7 yeah. Yeah. and it was amazing opened my mind opened my uh, eyes to a whole nother level of research and i just want to thank you for that gary i never oh, did no. get a chance it just showed up in the mail one day but i i never got a chance to delve into your past. And I want to go back to young Gary, where you were just starting out. What were you designing? How did you start the company? What got you involved in electronics? Well, now you're really, now you're going to date me. So I have to be careful here. Um, well, you know, let's, let's, let's look at this from a realistic point of view. Okay. So, you know, like most of us, you, you go to school, you learn a trade, you, um, or you find something that makes you happy in life. It does, whatever makes you happy, you pursue that. And you pursue that rigorously and to the best of your ability. That's a firm believer. I'm a firm believer in that. And uh, these are all things that I've been taught from a very young age from my parents. You know, always put best effort forward, no matter what you decide to do with your life. Sure. Um, so, you know, after going to school, I, um, you know, I, I took jobs in the high tech industry. So in these uh, positions, I, I worked with uh, companies that made devices that were very much in sync with the, the path that I'm on now, meaning all of the different types of sensory related things that I do, whether it be with temperatures or pressures or load cells or, you know, all those different things, frequencies and frequency measurement. And I learned all that, you know, working jobs out in the field. These were all, all things that um, became part of my everyday life. And from that, I took those skills and I decided to enable myself, have better control of my life and my destiny. And at a very young age, uh, in my 20s, I decided to start my own business. I did that with $6,000 in the bank. <laughs> okay. Wow. I mean, it was a risk I took. Um, I took a, a mortgage out of my house, didn't have much equity in it. Back then, interest rates were at 18% for a home mortgage. <laughs> okay. people, people think, oh my gosh, you know, 7%, you know, right. interest rates. Well, hey guys, you know, I, my mortgage, my first mortgage was 18%, and uh, it was a killer. 
So, um, but anyways, so I, I decided, you know, I've been married for, with the same woman for, uh, Cindy for uh, 43 years. Amazing. Um, and I decided, I said, let's take a chance, you know, and let's, let's make, make a go of it. So, uh, once we started the business, which was kind of a basic thing, I would go out to other companies and they would have problems and it could be something as simple as me, uh, meeting with the engineers over at Lego. You know, everybody knows Lego, so I'll use them. Right. And they said to me, hey, Gary, you know, uh, we're making these little Lego men and, you know, the heads get thrown on with a pick and place a robot. But sometimes they're on backwards. We want the heads to face forwards. What do we do? So um, I would look at the problem, look how many per second they were making. I'm like, OK, let's let's use a, a vision system. We'll use an encoder. You know, we'll rotate the heads. We'll take the features off the nose, the eyes. We'll know exactly where it's supposed to go. And boom using a few triggers with fiber optics and stuff, we can stop this thing and put those heads on properly. So those are the kinds of problems, simple problems, um, that I looked at as being a simple problem. And there's always a solution to a problem, no matter what you do, right? Absolutely. So, so you know, I started doing those kinds of things. So that's how my business was pretty much started, solving problems for other people based on knowledge and acquisition of skills that I developed over many, many years. And it, it, it paid off for me in a sense that I got to the point where, um, you know, we could have our first child. I wouldn't have a child unless I could support my family. So uh, Melissa was born. Melissa was born on Valentine's Day uh, in uh, 04. So, uh, I mean, in 87. So, so what happened was um, that was the first of three daughters and uh, Melissa was our first. And uh, from there, uh, you know, we just we just grew as a family very close and moved around a few times and got back home closer to our grandparents and uh, enjoyed, you know, family life to its fullest. And I was very close with the girls in the sense that one of the reasons I wanted to start my own business was I always wanted to be there for the family and for the girls. And that enabled me to do all those things, to watch them grow up, you know, to go to their gymnastics or go to their field hockey games or go to their recitals and dance routines. And all the wonderful things that I've always looked forward to, you know, uh, growing up. I mean, this to me, that was how family life should be, you know, to be, be a father. A, yeah, right. A father, be an integral part of the family and participate in that family. Um, and contribute something substantial to the, the, the growth uh, and well-being of your children. Uh, that's pretty much my, my philosophy on, on family life, you know. So it got to the point, you know, Melissa uh, was now 17 years old. And um, this leads me, I guess, to, to some of the stuff that uh, happened. And most people know my story, and I don't mind sharing it again. But, you know, Melissa was in um, a car accident. And... And this car accident uh, happened very close to home. And the day of the accident, the night of the accident, um, there was a certain amount of sensory perception that happened to me. It, it just, it just, I just felt something. So we were, we were so close that it allowed me to sense something wasn't right. I literally got out of bed, Sean. I got out of bed. Um, and I got dressed, I got dressed, feeling some sense of urgency. It was crazy to, you know, to, to, to sense and feel that. Um, and I went to the window and I looked down the street and I just stood there and I can't explain the feeling that I had other than it was, I felt very unstable. It was if, um, it was as if I had a twin or, or something, you know, some twins have this connection ability and they know when the other one's feeling pain or sorrow or distressed. I, sure. felt, that. I felt that. And I can't, I see a car coming down the street and I'm like, I felt relieved, but I didn't feel settled. And then I heard banging on the door. You know, mm -hmm. Melissa would have pulled into the garage and, and um, come into the house happy and said good night and i would have said good night and love you and that would have been the end of it but on this night um it was one of melissa's dear friends pounding on the door and she said melissa hit a tree uh, right down the road about a mile down the road so i was already dressed um i just 
ran out, hopped in my car, and I got there as fast as I could. And when I arrived, Melissa had slammed into a tree and smack dab in the middle of the front, and the entire front was crushed in. And I walked up to her, and um, her face didn't have any any injuries to it, and, and uh, held her hand and talked to her a little bit. She squeezed my hand a little bit. She was unaware, I don't think, of her surroundings. She was kind of dazed. I just tried to assure her that everything would be okay as much as I could. Oh. And the, the police arrived and uh, medics arrived and they, they kind of restricted me a little bit after that. And they, they uh, asked me to you know, stand aside, which I did, you know, and, but I was, I was a wreck at that point. Um, but when I say I was a wreck, I, I mean, inside of me you've, you're feeling a, a wave of emotion that you've never felt before so it's not like you have um a sorrow or you feel an injury like i've broken bones you know uh and and i've been hurt really bad and um you know my ribs have been smashed racing motorcycles and i've done all kinds of stuff you know but this this was um an unknown emotion that part of me felt so emotionally connected and concerned, but then there's another emotion that kicks in that was calming me down. It was really strange. I mean, it was like you're being pulled and pushed at the same time with, with, um, with um, emotional content, emotional feelings that, that you've never felt before. So, um, I went back home, uh, and I got my wife and, um, uh, we rushed to the hospital. And when I got there, paramedics said that Melissa was able to give them her name and um, all of her personal information in the ambulance. So that was a, a glimmer of hope. The story, as it was uh, revealed um, on Ghost Adventures uh, about Melissa's accent and such, it, it was really quite incomplete, okay? I want to get into something else um, that just insert something here. Um, Melissa had not been drinking that evening, which wouldn't have mattered either way because kids do that stuff anyways. But sure. uh, we found out that there was, uh, based on the doctors um, uh, at the hospital, they came up and the guy goes, you know, gives me the thumbs up and he goes, you know, there's no alcohol or drugs in her system. So I'm like, okay. Um, the, what happened was the reason for the accident is, which was never revealed is that she was trying to keep up with someone who was in front of her, a, a very dear friend. So the person in front of her was going a little bit too fast and she, she just lost control. So she hit the tree at about 60 miles an hour. That's what they're saying. And the, the, the darn road is only about. I know, barely 16 feet wide and it's a windy road with lots of trees so um needless to say um you know there there are a lot of other people there were some other people involved and there are a lot of feelings and emotions involved which um not only were we dealing with the the, the grief and the emotions associated with melissa but we we're also feeling the emotional trauma that was uh, uh, inflicted on the other individual, okay, which which we kept very private and we still keep very private. So um, these are some things, these are some tidbits of information that uh, we did not want revealed. But I look back now in time and there's probably so many unanswered questions that people had what, what may have really happened. And I'm much stronger today to, to deal with that and to talk with it. Whereas back then during the show, I didn't want to talk about it. You know, um, in fact, the, the person that she was with, um, I stayed with that person and used to work out with that person at the gym every day for two years, uh, mm -hmm. just to comfort him. 
and to help him get through. And I still keep in contact with, with that person, um, you know, maybe once or twice a year or every other year, whatever. But he is still very much involved in our family. We love him. He's always been very special to us. So, um, you know, she, Melissa was in the hospital and, uh, you know, her legs were badly messed up. You know, she had broke several bones in her legs. Uh, you know, they tried to, they fixed all her legs. They put rods in her legs. They did all that kind of crap. And, um, and then she never pulled out of, of a coma. They had to induce a coma because she had uh, swelling on, on the brain. Mm. And so after four days, we were all around her and we had to disconnect her from life support. Right. And, you know, it's, it's, it's what you would imagine it to be. I mean, it's, it's as distressing as you could ever imagine. And most parents would never want to even, you know, let that kind of a thought cross their mind. Mm. But so after that show, after the show and all these different things were revealed, what happens? You have two sides of the fence. You have people who come to you um, expressing, expressing compassion and sympathy and love. And then you have the extreme opposite of people that hate you, hate yeah. everything about you. And they don't know me and they don't know what I've done or why I've done certain things. And what I'm referring to is when we did the show, um, and one of the things I told the guys was, you know, I am not a self-promoting person. Uh, I don't like uh, to talk about my products, especially in a situation like this. Um, I don't want to give people the wrong impression because mm -hmm. people today jump to conclusions all the time. Um, you know, the things that I've created were created from love. Some people get it. Some people don't. They look for the negative in, in every situation of life and they'll never progress spiritually or uh, grow uh, in, in terms of understanding, acceptance, compassion, love, and, and helping your fellow man. They'll never understand it. And just to give you a, a serious, a more severe example of what I mean by that is there were actually, there's actually a couple of guys that went so far as to pull the police report um, from the Granby Police Department and, oh my publish, God. and publish that online. And I, I had never seen the police report. Quite truthfully, I've never, I, I, I didn't see it. So I didn't know what they had in their possession, but they were alluding to the fact that Melissa was drunk. Yeah. So, you know, I'm like, holy crap, you know? Um, and I can remember, I remember going to the police department, like, how could you release such private information yeah. about, you know, this situation on a minor to these idiots you know, with these websites and all they care about is defraud. Yeah. yeah, garbage. Without them knowing the truth, they were alluding to the fact that she was drunk. And I contact, I contact these people like, where do you get off, you know, um, assuming anything without the actual facts? Because what when it came to the part about the blood alcohol test, it was left blank. It was left blank because she was a minor. Sure. Okay. And when I went to the police department, I got it. And I felt in a way I felt like I, uh, I had to defend myself, but I didn't want to read the, t the report. I, I didn't really have a need to, you know, I believe what the doctors had told me. I believe what I felt in my heart to be true. You know, kids make mistakes. I did it. Yeah. You, know, you did it. All of us have done it. All of us have, you know, have had a beer or a few drinks or got drunk at one point or another in our life. Uh, but at least, you know, most people live to talk about it. In this case, it, it didn't work out that way. But I read the report over it. It showed that she had zero alcohol or drugs in her system. And I felt like I had to defend that, you know, um, to some extent. 
I Sounds to me like these were cynical skeptics looking to disprove your work. Well, they were. That's yeah. exactly it. You know, I mean, and so the first thing I did was I took a picture of it. I sent it to Zach. And I sent it to someone else. Uh, I think it was Dave Schrader or somebody. Mm -hmm. And and their response was, Gary, you don't have to prove anything to us. We believed you. Which which is the way it should be, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I remember holding that report in my hand, going into my garage where it was nice and quiet because my daughter Heather and she had a couple of friends over and they were listening to music or something. And I had my RT EVP with me and I sat down on the steps and I read the report to Melissa and her response almost, it, the response that I got from her, which I've I revealed and shared with many people, was, that's great. You know, tell mommy what, what you found out. You know, share that with mommy. And to hear her voice, it wasn't a voice like people capture on EVPs on a recorder, typically. This was like her talking to me on the phone with wow, with a little bit of reverb and, and a little bit of harmony to it. The harmonics were just beautiful. The pitch was beautiful. It was angelic. I, there's no other way of ex explaining it. You know, it, it, and she knew how much I was distressed by that. And she just wanted me to to share that with with Cindy. So and I did. Um, so that's kind of like the, the story with, with that whole thing. And I so much stuff that that you have inside and you don't typically reveal it because because it brings back so many different memories and you don't want. But but I'm coming to you now from a position of strength. It's taken a long time to, to reach that level, you know, yeah. you know, almost 18 years, 17 years. So, <clears throat> so that's, that's kind of like where it was left off. I mean, you know, there are people, there are all kinds of people out there and, um, you know, people were thinking that I was capitalizing on her death by creating products and profit. Sure. But what they don't know is just how much, um, that I've done with charities as a result of this, how many tens of thousands of dollars I give away to charities and I keep in very good contact with, and there's a reason for it. <clears throat> uh, it's called Mary's place and they're in Windsor, Connecticut. Now, Mary was a nun. She showed up out of the blue, um, at the hospital in our, um, in the intensive care unit at the hospital. And I was a little perplexed by that. She had a heart of gold, uh, the one most caring women I've ever met in my life. She believed in the afterlife. We had some wonderful conversations about it. Um, we invited her to our home. She came into our family room. I remember sitting on the floor and she was sitting in the chair next to me and we were very casual just hanging out and we talked I mean, we just had a cup of tea and and you know uh, just talked about everything we talked we talked about her own um paranormal experiences uh we talked uh, oh she's a firm oh she was a firm she just passed away but she lived in she moved from here to california she she was just a beautiful woman inside now right and she was there for us and i I couldn't do anything um, at that time um, financially <clears throat> um, for her at that time. But I, as soon as I w was in a position to do so, I began helping her organization. So, and I still do to this day, you know, 17 years later. That's so, amazing. so that's important. And one of my other favorites is, um, uh, St. Jude uh, Children's Hospital. And one of the things I just recently did um, on on Twitter was I I took one of my uh, one of my RTVPs uh, and I and I auctioned it off a silent bid. I see that. 
all the proceeds going to St. Jude. And you know, uh, you know that product has been around for eight or nine years. Um, you know, we we were hit really hard with uh, certain part shortages and things um, just got messed up and it just wasn't worth it because we weren't selling that many of them. And so I made the decision to discontinue um, you know, manufacturing it, but uh, it's a wonderful device for those who were able to figure it out. I don't really see it as being any more complex than than a, a uh, an iPhone today, but right you know, most people don't take the time to really learn things. And if you're like me, I look at a picture on a box where I put together my granddaughter's toys. So <laughs> and most of us do that, right? Right, exactly. So it's like, um, all right, so you, you're always looking for a shortcut because you don't like to spend so much time learning stuff. Right. But um, so that's that's kind of it. So right after Melissa passed away, and we dis disconnected her from life support. Um, you know, we started having some incredible things happen. And I, I'm not going to speak just for me because it happened to all of us. Every single one of us in the family uh, had some incredible experiences and events. I mean, my youngest daughter, Heather, uh, would when we first got home uh, over the course of the next month, she would see Melissa brushing her hair in the bathroom. And it would just be me, Cindy, and my daughter, Heather, in the house. So my daughter, Heather, would come home. You know, she was 10, 11 years old. She would go upstairs, feed her goldfish, do her homework. And on the way out, it got to be such a routine that she would come downstairs. We'd say, Heather, did you pick up your room? Yes, I did. Heather, did you feed your goldfish? I did. Did you do your homework? Yes. And she goes, okay, I'm going to go out and play now with Rachel. I'll, I'll be back in 30 minutes. That was back in the good old days when kids actually went outside and threw hoops and stuff like that, you know? Um, and she goes, oh, by the way, oh, she'd go out the door and then she'd open the door. By the way, I saw Melissa brushing her hair in the bathroom again. And I'm like, oh, well, Cindy and I would look at each other like, oh my gosh. You know, I mean, to have an apparition that solid and that magnificent, uh, for, for, you know, and, and viewed through the eyes of a 10 year old. Amazing. That is unbelievable. I mean, Heather had the innocence and heart of an angel. Mm -hmm. So, um, she still does, you know, and she ended up being a fourth grade teacher. So I look at that and I'm saying, well, you know, what, what's going on here? You know, and I've never seen her. I've never physically seen her. Uh, my ex son-in-law who passed away a couple of years ago, uh, he was on the show, Mike, um, he saw her in her bedroom. And this is when my daughter, uh, and, and he were, were, uh, you know, married and he was working at, as a, an MP at the sub base in Groton, Connecticut, he would come and visit on the weekends and he went up to take a shower and there's Melissa standing in her bedroom, uh, you know, by the edge of the bed. And he, he froze, he literally froze. Sure. And I remember, I remember Jen and I and Cindy and Heather, we were watching TV and Mike came down and he sat down and he just had a blank look on his face. And I didn't think anything of it. And he didn't even tell us what happened because he, did, he, he couldn't absorb it into his mind that he had just seen a ghost or he had seen something that he didn't understand. So when that happened, he kept it to himself. He finally revealed what had happened. It was weeks later, he told us about the experience we talked a little bit on, about that on the show. Um, <clears throat> and uh, now, how long after Melissa's death, Gary, did these appearances start happening to the children and, and uh, oh, boyfriend? And well, it, it happened. It, you have to understand, Sean, this this wasn't something that just happened, you know, um, over a, a week or a month or a year. This continued on for years, okay. uh, several years. OK. Right. Um, you know, it happened so frequently that um, I wanted Melissa to be shared with people. I want, and this is why the show came up, you know, I mean, I wanted other parents to feel what we felt through our experiences. Yes. That was the only reason. I mean, it wasn't for any gain of any kind or advertising or any of that. That's, that's all crap to me. It doesn't really matter. Right. Um, it's insignificant, you know, um, the, the things that 
the letters that I was receiving from people, thousands of cards came in the mail. I can't, I can't even tell you. I mean, it was on the front page of the Hartford Current, you know, the, the mail meter and all this stuff. And I'm like, how, how did they find out about all this? I mean, I didn't think it was going to be anywhere near like that. I mean, one of the reasons why I've shied away from all the other opportunities out there is because I just don't want to open that door up again. You know, I don't, I don't like that feeling. I wouldn't want to be in public eye anymore because of that. Um, that doesn't excite me. It really doesn't. And um, so, it, you know, F, you know, when we started getting all these different types of experiences and stuff, uh, it just continued on and we absorbed it. And it was an amazing opportunity for us to, what's a good way of describing it, to, 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 better, to get a better grasp of things we normally wouldn't pay attention to. I mean, it opened our eyes. It uh, opened our perception of life. It, um, you know, the, the whole intention here from Melissa was to let us know that she was safe and alive somewhere else. And through all these different signs and contacts and communication that she provided, how silly would we be if we just ignored all that and chalked it up to just being in your mind? I mean, of course, I can't, I can't imagine somebody ignoring that kind of stuff. Why yeah. would you do that? Right? Right. That's yeah, crazy. What was the product? When was that magic moment when you're in studio or you're in your office? In my lab. Working, yeah. In your, yeah, in your lab. Yeah, yeah. And you're working on, I don't know, you're working on something. Well, you have it to comes through. How how did that come to be? Well, it's okay. So there were we were getting signs through the doorbell. You know, um, we were getting electromagnetic interferences and manipulation of uh, anything that was electrical. So it's a really a no brainer. It just Sean, if I was to tell you all the stuff that that spirits can do, you know, people would probably lock me up. But I'm not going to go there. Your body and your senses, your, your well-being, your, your ability to sense spirit is already part of who you are. You know yeah. that. I mean, it's, we all have it. But you need something to take that little ember and, and turn it into you know, a flame. And we all have that ember deep down inside. But m many of us don't wake it up. We don't ignite it. We don't care about it. Um, well, I care about it, okay? Right. And I was willing to take the next step to, to learn more about it. Uh, so when, when somebody is ringing the doorbell and somebody is turning the TV on at night, uh, every night at the same time or close to it, and that's followed by music in your bedroom with no stereo on, and then the music literally is a dynamic um, element that fills your room and, and two people, two wide awake people uh, with normal common sense and abilities uh, hear it at the same time. And that same music drifts, and I say drift, from your bedroom, out of the bedroom door, down the hallway, into, <laughs> into your family room. And then the stereo turns on in front of you you begin to wonder what in the world is happening. And, <laughs> and, and my wife and I are like, we're getting ready to go to bed. And all of a sudden we hear music all around us. And she looks at me, she goes, do you hear that? And I'm like, yeah, where's that coming from? We're the only two people in the house right now. Right. Okay. What's going on? And I'm like, it's over me. It's right over my head. She goes, no, I hear it over by the TV. And we both get out of bed and we're like, it's over by the door, you know? And so we had, we're walking behind it. And as we're walking behind it, the music is just like four or five feet in front of us going all the way down a 75 foot hallway. Come on, Sean. That is like yeah. amazing. What yeah. an amazing experience. So, um, yeah, I mean, we've had, I've had stuff where we've walked into the room and we, you know, we're pulling down the covers and we're talking. And also, we hear a snap and the light comes on. A snap. The, it's a rocker switch. The rocker switch snaps when you turn it on. It literally went from off to on. And we're right there like, did you 
see and hear that? That, that whole switch just literally flipped. Um, so a lot of cool, th- a lot of cool things like that. So I knew that, you know, ghost, I think it was uh, ghost hunters was really popular at that time, you know, on TV and I never watched the shows, but you know, once that starts happening, you start watching the shows, you know, to figure out what's going on because I knew nothing about the paranormal. I didn't even know what that word meant. Why would I know what that word meant? It's stupid stuff that, that I would not be involved with. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'd rather be out, you know, fixing my car or, you know, going skiing or, you know, I used to fly hang gliders back then. I, I'd rather be doing fun stuff, you know? So, but no, this whole thing just took me by, by surprise, you know? And so I, I sat down I'm like, okay, so how about if I come up with right now they're using, you know, off the shelf products or they're hacking things and people are, well, people were very ingenious back then. I mean, people were coming up with little things, anything they could to get a better understanding. So the Melmeter was born only because I felt it was the most simplistic thing that could be manipulated. Um, So the Melmeter detected uh, electromagnetic fields, both AC and DC. DC would be more of a natural electromagnetic field, like from the Earth's core. Um, AC is typical stuff that you would pick up in a house. So you know, there was a lot of cool things that that I knew could be manipulated. And son of a gun, if in using that in my prototype, I would, you know, I would ask Mel certain things and I would see fluctuations. A lot of people think that spirits are made up of EMF, but that's really not the case. It's just their ethereal energy that has the capacity and abilities to manipulate the environmental things that that we're all familiar with. Um, I mean, if a spirit really wanted to get through to you, they'll talk to you if you're in the damn shower, just through the sound of, of a shower drain, you know, mm-hmm. um, or they will use various types of media, whether it be a, a television or radio or anything else. It depends how badly they want to speak to you. Um, you know, that's one of the things I wanted to get into with you, Gare. Um, mm-hmm. These different, and, and over the years, man, I've done this, I grew up in a haunted home. You know some of my backstory. Mm-hmm. Uh, I witnessed her. My father witnessed her. My mother witnessed her. It was a woman, an apparition of a woman. She had hung herself in our home on the south side of Indianapolis. Anyway, I always say I never had a chance not to believe in the paranormal. I grew mm-hmm. up with it. So I've spent my life looking for answers. And, um, you know, I just I wondered why are spirits around us all the time? They're around us all the time. 100%. Why don't we make more direct communication with them? Is there spirit guides that you have to be in touch with, like some mediums say, to get you in in good with the other side to talk? Mm. What, what's up with that? All right. Let me, let me, I'll give you my, my viewpoint on that. Mm-hmm. First off, I, 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 without a doubt, Sean, there are spirits all around us on a daily basis. Some are good. Some are bad. Just like we go out every day, you go shopping, you don't think anything of it. You're walking down an aisle. You got people walking back and forth. You're minding your own business. They're minding their own business. You're in a mall, whatever. You know, you don't know anything about the character of that person. You don't know anything about their personality, what they've done, uh, where they're from. Well, the same thing applies in the spirit realm or spirit worlds. Right. I believe, based on my own personal research, especially now the Radio XITC, Amazing. that thing has opened up an unbelievable window of opportunity. Um, and I'm I'm only saying that because, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm only saying that because the stuff that I'm now getting out of it, um, it actually has me a little bit concerned. Okay, uh, concerned only because uh, it it's a complex device. And a lot of people may look at it as as something that you just flip on and you start receiving, you know, spirit communication. But getting back back focused on your question. So the issue then becomes there are different realms or different layers of spirits. There are days when I communicate and I'm talking to spirits that are influential, they're positive, they're polite. Um, most of them have the same theme. 
most of the spirits that we talk to, I want to say 90, better than 90% of the spirits that we talk to through sweep devices or recorders, if you want to consider that ITC. The RTEVP was an ITC device, but a recorder is not, in my opinion. Right. The um, <clears throat> and, and the only separation between the two is the RTEVP allowed you to encode and decode the data in within one second of recording it into a file, and it would extract the file and then play back whatever it heard in that one second to you. Or real two-way communication. It's yeah. Real two-way communication. I've always been an advocate of how do I enable two-way communication and how do I do it clearly? And I thought the RT was going to solve everybody's problems, but, uh, you know, Zach used it on his show and they never got anything from it. You know, um, they didn't think that it was better than what they were currently using. So it never really took off from that point of view, uh, which, as you know, if, if a product isn't used successfully, in the eyes of viewers who are watching these influential shows, the product goes nowhere, okay? So I could spend tens of thousands of dollars developing a product because I believe in it. I really do. But if that product doesn't get proper exposure and marketing for others to realize that through influential shows, it'll go nowhere. Exactly. And I have probably designed and built 30 to 40 products that I've literally just <laughs> wiped off my shelves because um, it's, I don't want to say it's controlled, but I don't have that kind of influence, you know, to show people or tell people how great something is without proving it. All right. And I don't typically like to prove my products. I like people who are using them in the field to use it and show their results of how well it works. Oh, sure. You know, I mean, I don't go out in the field anymore. I don't, I don't go out and it's not necessary because I can turn on my device anywhere and talk to a spirit. Okay. It doesn't matter if I'm, I'm in my home now. It doesn't matter if I'm at home. It doesn't matter if I'm at the shop. You know, I could be in my car. I could be anywhere. If I turn on a device uh, and you make it easy enough for them to communicate and, and you have the ability of deciphering that and understanding what they're saying, they'll open up to you. You know, and I, I think one of the last things I mentioned in a recent post, and I use Twitter pretty much exclusively. I don't use Facebook and all these other things because I just don't have time for it. But, um, you know, I mentioned that if if you have the skill, if you have the, the right skills to understand, decipher, and connect with spirit at their level, they're more inclined to communicate back to you, all right? If you're, you know, just an average person and and I hear this all the time with a sweet, you know, with the SP7 or something else, you know, they will say, you know, they'll return it. <laughs> you, you buy it on Amazon and next thing they use it for two weeks, they return it. Um, right. And they say, oh, this thing doesn't work. Or they'll give you, you know, a one star review or something. Yeah. And those are the people that really shouldn't be using it in the first place, you know. No. Uh, so, uh, but we're talking about spirits. There are, what I've discovered is that there are layers of spirits. Some of them can be bad. And the ones that are bad, you know, I often refer to as having like low moral standards, meaning uh, some of them admit to doing certain to doing certain deeds, which to many would be very shocking. All right. They'll admit to a crime or they'll admit to me that they killed somebody or they'll admit to being a bad person. I've or, heard you actually get into it with the spirit on oh, your Twitter. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I've had I've had conversations with. Um, what I refer to as low level spirits, um, and naughty spirits, you know, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll say something funny to them. And, um, I said, okay, let's, let's do a session and, and let's talk about this one thing. And rather than calling you a negative or a low, low level, I'm just gonna say you're a naughty spirit. You, you know, you, you just don't meet the kind of standard that I, you're not the kind of guy I would normally hang around with. Okay. Right. right. So, I mean, for whatever reason, I'll say to you, for whatever reason, I'm not going to judge you. Let's just talk. Just the way you and I are talking, Sean. Okay, let's just talk, and they get comfortable with that. 
And in my session yesterday, it was 30 minutes. They got very comfortable with it. Oh, they told me all kinds of stuff. And I was kind of taken back, but I wasn't surprised because the more you talk to them, the more at ease you are, the more comfortable you feel, and the more easy it is for them to reveal and talk. Now, whether you want to believe them or not, that's that's up to you. But I got to tell you something, when they start telling me why they would use the word demon during a ghost hunt or why, you know, why they would, you know, spit out the word demon during a, a sweep session with a spirit box, you know, um, you, you'll be surprised. I mean, it's it's for shock and awe. And to them, it's a game. You sure. know, they told me that it's a game. And they said, because people believe it. You know, and they'll say, well, because it's in the Bible, you know, and uh, hey, we're not hurting anybody. These are actual responses that they told me yesterday. We're not hurting anybody. It's a game. Mm -hmm. So when you when you start to hear that, they become instead of an invisible mm, and invisible force, you start to see visions of who they were as people. You know what I'm saying? It's like. These were people once, right? Right. And, you know, you and I are having this conversation and they're listening right now to us. So they understand uh, me and I understand them. I mean, for them to ask me recently, you know, how's the lake? Knowing that I live on a lake, all right? Mm -hmm. um, or, you know, how's Melissa doing? And these were real things that they were asking me. And I'm like, do you seem to be a, a great observer? What else would you like to say? He goes, I do a lot of listening. My life has been fine. How's your life been? I do a lot of listening. Yeah. Okay. See, yeah. people don't realize that. Um, you know, people people are misinformed, ill-informed in many cases. You know, people say, oh, ask them uh, who's the president of the United States. <laughs> I always get a kick when someone says, well, these you're not talking about dummies here, okay? Uh, if you're in your house and you have a spirit around you and you have the news on, believe me, or a radio, or if you're in conversation, engaged in conversation with somebody about politics, they pick up on that. OK, I had a conversation with them the other day about Putin and invading Ukraine. And typically I don't get into politics. OK, mm -hmm. but I, I I got into this conversation with them because I wanted to understand what would happen to an individual like that when this is all said and done. You know, how is he going to be judged? Sure. I mean, I think we're all quite a bit distraught by what we've seen in this world over the past few years. You know, I'm sickened by it, actually. You know, I, I, I worry about my grandkids growing up uh, in this world today. Uh, and spirits opened up to me about it. And I'll, I'll just tell you what they said. Um, one spirit uh, said that he switched sides through this, through this action. He literally switched sides. And another spirit said, God will judge him. And what one spirit said next really made me think. They said that he lost his fear of God. Hmm. Just like that. He lost his fear of God. So, you know, people, and I can't tell people enough how serious this is, but you're going to be judged by your actions in this lifetime there's no question about it sure you know and we've all done things but they're harmless things you know in many cases uh, there's forgiveness at the end of the road for you uh for others who have done some really bad things when you watch the news when you watch the killings the shootings and uh, it's just horrible when you see these things oh it's every day yeah well those people are going nowhere Okay, right. if they only knew um, how serious uh, they'll be judged when their life comes to an end. And, you know, spirits have told me, the ones that have not crossed over, they, you know, in conversation, they said, would you want to be here? You know, literally. They 
Right. They hate it there. They hate it where they are. They plead and beg for help, many of them who have not crossed over. I don't have a way to help them. A lot of times what I'll do, Sean, is I'll turn on, I'll go to YouTube and I'll and I'll find a, a you know like a, a two hour, five hour thing on prayers. Mm-hmm. And I'll just play it. I've seen and, that. and just play it for them within the environment because they do hear it. And a lot of them thank me for that. You are coming. I'm waiting. So I, um, you know, can't really say much more than that, but you know, there are, we were talking about good and bad. And if you run across the wrong uh, spirit, spirit group, a lot of them um, are groups, a lot of them work in groups and they all have different skills. And what I mean by that is we're all familiar with attachments, at least those of us who have had attachments. I have had an attachment. I've had a psychic attack, okay, uh, about 10 years ago. Uh, It was brutal. Um, I don't wish it on anybody. Uh, It, you know, they can saturate your mind with uh, unsettling visions. Um, They can, in worst case scenarios, you can hear them talking to you, mocking you. Uh, it just goes on and on. So in those situations, um, I have found, and I can talk from a position of knowledge and wisdom in that in that case, uh, in that situation, spirits um, don't work alone. And they will try to break you down. And you have to be of strong mind, body, and soul. And I mean that sincerely, to be able to contend with that. And if you are ill-informed, or you don't have a clear understanding of what you're dealing with, a weak person will buckle and break. So there are situations out there and and we see it every day um, through actions of individuals with guns. You hear them talk about hearing someone talking to them, inferring that God told them to do something. Uh, you know, or, you know, some voice in their head told them to, to pull the trigger. It was the right thing to do. That's the power of an attachment from its strongest perspective. Sure. They can do that to a human being. People don't realize that. So if you don't have an understanding of what you're dealing with, And you go into this thing blind. You're dealing with an invisible adversary. You're dealing with someone who has a very strong advantage over you. And if you believe everything that you hear, well, you could succumb to a mental health breakdown. Something could happen to you. A lot of people don't realize that. Okay. This these types of things happen every day and from a the mildest point of view or the mildest sense of an attachment people are sleepless they they have insomnia they have racing thoughts um they have heart palpitations if you had a prior injury you'll feel aches or pains um their abilities to invoke certain changes within your well-being um, can be quite pronounced and they can also take a toll on somebody because you don't understand what's happening to you in that sense either. Mm-hmm. So, you know, when I read posts on Twitter from people who say, oh, I can, I can hear them, I can relate, okay? It takes a very strong person to be able to flip and switch them off. And if you have developed that strength it's something I've always wanted to be able to do. If you have that strength and ability and you're patient and you're willing to work with it, you can achieve your goals, even in that. So spirits are uh, probably one of the biggest mysteries of our world, of our universe. You know, I've been places before, certain places, Gary. And I've set up, you turn on the uh, spirit box and boom, right away, I'm receiving 
you know, how many fingers am I holding up? Five. A direct yeah. response. Yeah. Um, there's Octagon Hall in Franklin, Kentucky. I went out there. It's an old Civil War Confederate hangout. Uh, it made mm -hmm. racial slurs referring to a picture of an African-American Union soldier on the wall. Uh, there's just all these different types of experiences. And then I took the a spirit box that I just got. Mm -hmm. Not too long ago, there, right? There. Oh yeah, is that yeah. the ANC or the regular SB Love? It's the ANC. Okay, and I'm still learning with it. I'm still messing with the ANC device on it. Love the thing, but I just haven't had from home. I haven't had that much experience with it yet or results. And I was going to ask you: Is there something that maybe I'm not doing to get in the right mindset? You know, a lot of mediums say you have to call out to your uh, spirit guides and uh, all this and that. I'd never believe that. I believe spirits there. If they want to talk, they're going to talk. Yeah. So, you know, what, what do you think? Okay. Well, let me see. How do I break that one down a little bit? Um, well, with the SB 11 or with any spirit box, um, a lot, a little bit, a lot of it has to deal with uh, your ability to interpret very quickly. Your mind has to be able to click and rationalize what you're hearing um, in real time. A lot of people, some people can do it quite cleverly um, and quickly. Other people, it takes a little bit of ability to learn and adapt to because you're hearing things that are not normal to begin with. So, you know, how do you pull out key words that are specific to your questions when something is flying by at a rapid pace, right? Right. Um, and plus it's annoying. Uh, it's a little bit annoying if if you don't have that skill. I've developed the ability to be able to block out overlapping sounds. And what I mean by that is I could hear, I could be talking and a spirit will speak under my voice and it becomes recorded. So when I play it back, I will literally block out my voice and I will just focus in on what I hear the spirit saying. A lot of people can't do that kind of stuff. A lot of people hear the dominant sound that comes through a, a device, but the underlying sound is just as important as your question. But sure. if you're unable, but if you're unable to hear that, now let me address something else. You're holding up two fingers. Well, your brain knows you're holding up two fingers, right? <laughs> um, your your mind knows you're holding up two fingers, and it becomes a thought in your head. So what happens? You're projecting your thought. Your thought is energy. Your thought becomes a loudspeaker to the spirit world. So your thought of holding up two fingers is not really a secret at all. It's a known fact. Okay. So, and, and everybody around you knows you're holding up two fingers. So it's, it's, not, it's not that simple because our thoughts, uh, even with uh, attachments, our uh, attachments prey on the thoughts that you have in your head and they can respond to them very simply. So, um, you know, one of the first things that Melissa and I would do when we communicated was when she would come and visit and lay down in the bed or lay between, uh, let me, that brings up a whole new story, but, um, you know, it's all thought projection. So when you communicate with your loved one, say you're um, in the alpha state or you're in, in, in a sleep state that uh, is conducive to to communication uh it's it, you're really communicating through thoughts but you hear your voice you're not really moving your lips or creating sounds for your vocal cords you're you're projecting a thought and yet it's your own voice it's really kind of cool it's the same method of 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 communication that extraterrestrials would use, you know, in communicating. It's to me, it's not a big deal because I've done it so much. And I've also learned that when I have spirits around me, I can communicate to them through through a thought. Uh, 10 years ago, when when I had that psychic attack, um, I could hear their thoughts, essentially, and they could hear my thoughts. And then I would hear them audibly respond to my thoughts. So nothing could be more annoying to a human being than having somebody read your thoughts. So that proved 
um, that's that really did improve a lot to me. And all of that, all these skills and all these experiences compounded together, the enlightening ethereal exp experiences combined with some of these other things that were more negative undertones to them. When you combine all those together, Sean, you have a pretty potent package um, of skills. Right. So, so I've got experiences that are so enlightening and beautiful. I've got experiences that are negative and nasty. And when you take the negative and you take the enlightening skills and you put them on a fulcrum, they have to be balanced. So your life and the universe, your life in the universe, uh, your existence depends on, on balance and symmetry. Um, I don't know a lot about mediums and how they operate. Some gifted mediums have told me that I have skills that are, are uh, lend themselves to that. And I'm like, well, I have experiences, but certainly not in the ability of ringing up you know, a loved one, at least right. not at the level that a good skilled medium can do. Um, have I been able to connect with um, deceased loved ones? I have. Have I been able to do it for other parents who have lost children? I've been able to do that too. And, I, and after the show, Cindy and I traveled. Uh, we got so many pleas from so many people to help them that we traveled. And I would take the RTEVP, put on a headset. We would meet with them in their homes and I would do a session and I would tell them everything that their loved one said back to what they had to say. So in many respects, I was hearing directly from their loved ones and I was just relaying the messages back to the parents. How do you clear the room? If so many spirits are around us, how do you? It was, it was the voice, Sean. It was the vo was voice. It? it was the voice. I recorded the EVPs and I and or the responses I gave it to to the loved ones. And in oh, many wow. cases, it, it was it was uh, the mom or you know the son or what have you. They weren't scratchy little voices. They were clear voices. Oh speaking. wow! Um, one girl, her mom passed away. The mom, the girl was going through all kinds of uh, issues social issues as most kids do in high school well she quit school and uh, she ran with the wrong crowd mm. and the mom passed away and they had a fallout before she had passed away they never made amends or hugged each other goodbye or you know they it was just a horrible separation between the mom and the daughter and the, the girl was a friend of Melissa's. So I agreed to help her, I went to her house. And the, the daughter at that point had re-enrolled back into high school and she made up her tests and she was going to be able to graduate. And one of the things that the daughter was so proud of was she, she wanted her mom to know that she was going to graduate with her class. And the mom came through very loud, Sean. It's so loud that I was able to play back right for, for them in that room. She said, I'll be there. I love you. I'll be there. Oh, wow. In her voice, in the mom's voice. Um, the, the most important thing, the most important thing was uh, that they, they got to say to each other that they loved each other again. And that brought, see, I'm getting a little choked up just listening, just remembering this. That brought closure for the mom. It brought closure for the daughter. That was really important. Oh, yeah. you know, and, and that's, and the reason I was able to do that is because I asked Melissa to help. In every single case, I called out for Melissa to help me bridge the gap between this parent, these parents, and this child to help bring closure. And it worked. Just like it worked for the show, you know, a, a month or month and a half before the show on Ghost Adventures, I, I kept saying, Melissa, 
make sure you're there, make sure you're there. You know, it's your birthday. We're going to do this to help other parents. You know, we want other people to know that their kids are safe and there's life after death. And I don't want other people to feel the same pain that we felt. That's really what it was all about. Right. How do I alleviate the pain that a parent feels um, through through some, a very powerful media, which was, you know, television? It was the right thing to do. Sure. I, after that episode, I had Anderson Cooper contacting me to be on his show. I had Fox News contact me to be on their show, make appearances. I had all this different stuff, and I just flat out turned it all down. It's just, it was... I did what I wanted to do. That's as far as I wanted to go. And I was happy with it. You know, yeah. I did do one more thing with uh, Zachary Quinto. Uh, he played Mr. Spock on Star Trek. Mm -hmm. um, he he took over Leonard uh, Nimoy's uh, position in, in Search Of. Right. And I love that show. I always watch that. Oh, you know, it was amazing. Was that an amazing show? I loved it. Growing loved up it. as a kid. Said, yeah. That stuff, you know, I mean... It really opened your eyes. Um, it's kind of like the un unsolved mysteries. That yeah, goes exactly. <laughs> you know? That's that. That's really what what we all love growing up as kids. You know, it's like, yeah. it was fascinating. So when he he uh, made the offer, contacted me to to be on the show. I'm like, you know, that sounds really wonderful because it'll give me another way of showing people that this is real. You know, how do I show people it's real? That's really what it's all about. You know, if, if I appear on another television show, it's it's really to to help people benefit through through uh, things that I've done. And so that to make their life uh, a little bit more simplistic or better understanding or to comprehend things at a different level. Um, right. The Radio XITC, um, I think, will help a lot of people accomplish that. I'm not talking about the average person, Sean. I don't think that this device should go into the hands of an average person because I wouldn't be able to support it. You know, I wouldn't be able to help them, you know. Um, and I, I'm really horrible at technical writing and, and coming up with all these, you know, inclusive manuals and technical instructions and stuff. But, I, you know, I'll have to do that, you know, uh, with this product. It is so busy. There's over 2,000 options. Yeah. and configurations uh in this device and for over a year uh actually three years because i have three prototypes i've been going through every option to try to find out the right combination that actually works it's just gonna have to be trial and error it's trial and error for me and it's, yeah. it's taking me hundreds and hundreds of hours software and hardware and time invested you know, I probably have, you know, six figures invested in just, you know, time. So it's like, what do you do with that? And I know darn well that if it gets into the average person's hands, uh, it won't be used properly. And then it, I'll be getting all kinds of emails and phone calls <laughs> from people. Yeah. So I have to give that a lot of thought. It's kind of a weird thing to think about, but I have to give that a lot of thought. Well, they're just going to have to practice with it. You know, practice. That's what I tell people. I say it's a research tool, man. You know, if you don't have ITC experience or spirit box experience and you don't have the inclination to sit down and experiment, then it's really not for you. Unfortunately. Exactly. You know, you know, the one thing that blew my mind was the SB7 when I was first using it and I was sitting at the table at, at a haunted location. I forget where. And I had actually plugged it into my computer running Audacity. And mm -hmm. I was recording it as I went. And gosh, I hate reviewing EVP stuff. You know, who, who just wants oh, yeah. it right there, you know? Yeah. But I rewound it and I was like, I got nothing on this one. But when I played that back, I had full sentences. Oh, yeah. My ear didn't pick up because, you know, on the spectrum, we're deaf compared right. to birds and stuff like that. So right. the things that we're missing that are going on around us right now. I mean, while while we're having this conversation is amazing. It's amazing. And here's the thing about the Radio X. You know, we you have to recognize certain flaws and deficiencies within our own abilities. One of one of them is comprehension of material or sounds that we're unaccustomed to. And when you missed all those wonderful responses, that's why, by the way, that's why I say to people, 
they say, oh, I never got anything. I'm like, send me a five minute clip. Let me pull everything out for you so that you can see what you've missed. Nine times out of 10, there's some really great stuff in there. Right. Um, but the average person, again, isn't adept at listening for those types of things. So with the Radio X ITC, which I just happen to have right there. There she like is, that. baby. Yeah. yeah. Only because, you know, I wasn't sure if you want to go through any of, of the settings and stuff. But the... Um, <laughs> The, the cool thing about that is uh, I have CD quality um, sound reproduction and rewind with this thing. So if I hear something that sounds like um, my mind and my brain deciphered, I'll just simply rewind it and listen again. And I would tell spirits, I'm like, guys, you know, before I get into this, I want you to know how this works for me. I'm so dedicated at being able to understand and hear you that I've included a feature that allows me to rewind and listen to you more carefully because you deserve to be heard as much as I deserve to be able to talk to you. So um, I want everything to be good for both of us. Why are you in my space? What work do you do here? What is your job? What is your job? And so I will rewind it. I don't care if I rewind it five times, as long as I can figure it out. And while I'm rewinding it, because I have a CD card, I have a micro CD card on the board, while I'm rewinding it on the playback side of the CD, of the, of the card, uh, of the audio, I have the ability of adjusting volume and um, high and low pass filtering and playback speeds and, you know, um, reverb, the reverb strength, uh, there's just uh, signal strength, there's just a billion things that I can adjust. And me being the kind of person that I am, I want everything to be perfect. It's just the right. way I want everything right, good. So I will continuously do that until I say, ah, I got it. It finally clicked. Here's what you said. Sorry it took so long. Let's move on. Okay, so without the ability of playing back, most of us are really incomplete in our duties. We're not doing our due diligence out there in the field. Unfortunately, a lot of these paranormal investigators are out there and I go crazy when I watch somebody's random YouTube video using the SB7. I'm like, you didn't hear that. You just, there's like five word response, blah, 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 blah. No, nothing, you know, and, and so I'll record that and I'll send it to that person. I'm like, here's what you have to do. That's how much of a perfectionist I am. I'm like, all right, man, you're missing it. Here's what you have to listen for, okay? And I'll slow it down. He goes, oh my gosh, I can't believe what setting should I use, blah, blah, blah. Thank you for helping me. Um, it's, it's really about you know, experience, trial and error, but more importantly, it's, it's really about you wanting to learn and do better. Uh, the APF processor that I created um, you know, is basically dedicated for just the SB7 and other people's spirit boxes. I don't care. It can be Sean's, you know, go stops, um, whatever it is, uh, S box or something, mm. uh, or it can be somebody's hack box or it doesn't really matter. I made it to help people, um, take control over their spirit box sessions in on the way, playback, correct? On the playback, you can slow it down, you can rewind it, you can adjust the high pass filter. You know, a lot of the spirit responses are at a low level. And, and so what I do is I try to block some of those lower frequencies and elevate their pitch a little bit so you can hear it a little bit more clearly. Well, the, the APF processor does that wonderfully, you know, for people. The problem was I was hand building them all and the price of ICs and everything, all the expenses that go, goes into this stuff, mm. you know, even even the the box, you know, we were 
hand cutting and drilling and it, you know it takes me it could take me four hours five hours to build an APF processor in our shop uh, from scratch sometimes longer if we're having a problem and so you know from from that point of view uh, you know it was expensive you know we're selling them for like 299 dollars but if you get it with you know an sp7 and all the you know i throw in a couple of you know nine volt rechargeable batteries you buy those rechargeable batteries on amazon they're 18 dollars a piece you know and i throw in a couple of those throw in a recharger do all that different stuff and it quickly the price quickly goes up well a lot of people can't afford that you know that's right. that's been a um, a really difficult hurdle to overcome so so we had to invest in some equipment in some ways to bring the price down and that's really at the i'm at that doorstep now and by making it easier and faster to build i can afford to sell it through distributors so they can make their margins and it will be more readily available to to a lot more people out there uh, the anc mini was the same thing anc mini and i should get you one of those anc mini does what the the SB11 ANC does uh, for the SB7. So a lot of people, I was just reading a comment from somebody, you know, they got the SB7, but they, they just can't get past some of the, the noise. So I'm like, hey, you know, the ANC Mini was designed for $69. You can solve that problem. You know, right. it'll use the noise, it'll let through the stronger responses. And really, to be honest with you, I don't care. I mean, the, I'm finding out with the Radio X ITC that the low level of responses, I shouldn't say low level, but the more subtle, lower volume responses are just as important as the loud ones. And from the 30 minute session that I had last night, a lot of those were at a lower volume that would require like headphones to hear. But I don't want to exclude those because they're all valuable and important in what I've done. Sure. So, you know, there's so much there that, that we have to take into consideration when, when doing our sessions. But, you know, there are, uh, like I said earlier on, we all, there's always a solution to a problem. Even a spirit told me that. Spirit, you know, when I said, I'm having trouble with this right now, I'm having trouble adjusting it properly. The spirit response was, Gary, there's always a solution to a problem. Now, I don't know where that came from. I don't know if they were earthbound or ethereal level types of responses, but it was a pretty awesome thing to hear because it was one of the most positive responses you can get from the spirit world. Where do you think they are, Gear? You think they're in limbo or they uh, do they see what we see? Is it just a, a veil that they're crossing? The ones that are closest to us. Yeah, the ones, the ones that are closest to us. Okay, there are those that can hear me speaking that I truly believe are separated with a very thin veil, a very thin film of separation between us, where we are in this realm, and them, okay? Then there are those, and I wanna call them the more aggressive um, spirits, that have found a way to seep through a crack somehow into our realm, in, in our space. They're physically in our space. They're not separated. Many spirits, when I talk to them, will say like, you know, where are you? Uh, what part of the country are you from? Um, you know, that kind of stuff. And they have no clue where, where I'm at. At least that's my perception of it, meaning that they don't, they could be lying and they could be all around us. But my belief is that there are different tiers and there is a separation um, consisting of some barrier that, that keeps most of them in one location. Then there are those which we see via light anomalies, whether it be a little flick of a light uh, streaming across the room or a zigzag of, of a light source those types of things that get picked up, they're actually in our realm. They're not separated. So I'd like to think that the ones that are local, that are physically in our space, they're the ones that resist moving on for some, for some reason. 
the other ones that are protected by another thin membrane or veil between us, they, you know, they're the ones that are calling out for help asking, you know, what do I do? You know, help us, you know, uh, it's horrible where we are. I mean, just one, one type of response after another that just describes a very dire situation for them. You know, it's a, sure. a sad and, and um, it's just a sad existence is, is the best way I can describe it. That's my vision of, of that. Uh, but the ones that are in our realm, I don't know how they got so close to us. Um, most of them are um, here for the wrong intentions. Some of them are here for really? the wrong intentions. Yeah, I, I do believe. Yeah, because because you can watch. Okay, but I can watch um, YouTube videos, or I can watch a television show. I was watching a, a TV show, The News, and you know, I, my eyes see everything. And I saw something, you know, zigzag near one of the news people on, on air in live TV. And I said to my wife, I said, quick, you got to see this. And I paused and I rewound. I said, watch this and step by step, frame by frame. Sure enough, something about the size of a golf ball uh, comes into the frame of view, literally does a 360 around one of the news guys sitting at his desk and right. then and then disappears but it happens so quickly um that the average person wouldn't see it but my eyes can see that kind of stuff and i think a lot of people who are uh prone to that over time you pick up it's almost a sense about you you have yeah. a more acute ability uh, to see things than than the average person. The same just same reason why I can pick up hearing a lot better than the average person. I have a sensitive side, and I have a not so sensitive side. You know, my right side seems to be extremely sensitive to things in the environment. You know, I got to say, the work you've done over the years has impressed uh, everyone, or it should have impressed everyone. But I know it's blown my socks away, and it's changed the way that I've done everything in the field. And uh, like I said, I have the utmost respect for you. At the very beginning, I put you up there with the greats. And I think you're the one that's going to take us to the next level of spirit communication. And I think that's where the answers lie. The spirit communication through the audio responses, uh, things that we can measure. You know, but that what we're going with now, though, is the skeptics are coming out and they're saying things like, well, what are we dealing with now? Raising the noise floor. That's the one you hear a lot of times. What does uh, that mean? What does that mean? Raising the noise floor? Well, you when you raise an audio edit, when you raise the level of sound so oh. high that your okay. brain tries to make sense out of. The oh, camera. yeah. Well, you know, Sean, I, I am not a big. Uh, advocate of spectral analysis and spectral filtering and all these weird things. You know, I right. mean, there are some people that use it a lot. And, you know, I used to use it a lot. But now with Radio X and the ability of playing it back the way that I want to, yeah, I don't need that. You don't need it. I don't need it. And, you know, I've sent some uh, clips to uh, Chris, Chris Fleming, and uh, to Zach. And, you know, they're, they're, I'm sure that in many cases we can hear things at the same level uh, through some of the more advanced responses that I've gotten with Radio X. And to have things understood or heard um, similarly between people is one of the biggest challenges I've had. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, that's always been a question in my mind why is it that I can hear something so damn clearly and the next person can't hear it at all? Stuff that I hear, you know, as if I'm speaking to you, uh, my wife cannot hear. My wife cannot hear. And I say to her, I said, that's probably a good thing, you know, right. because uh, then you'd be opening yourself up to extraneous influences from other things that you're not comfortable with. And I wouldn't wish, I wouldn't want anybody to undertake, um, you know, a position of, of curiosity in this sense. 
right. to, to, to pursue something like this out of curiosity without being willing or able to handle the risks associated with it. Okay. Right. So <clears throat> I know, and I've, I've told a lot of people that, and some people will say to me, well, Gary, uh, you know, what do you think about using it into your home? Isn't that going to open the door to, you know, all kinds of stuff happening to you? And I look at it from the point of view that I have enough knowledge and wisdom gained through the years. Uh, and I've had enough experiences at all different levels that I don't think there's anything more that, that, that can be done, you know, to surprise me. Right. So if I hear a spirit say something to me, um, I'll just, I just brush it off. You know, I shrug it off. If I hear or feel something uh, around me, I'm like, not now, you know, I'm relaxed, chill out, yeah. you know? Um, so it's so, it's not abnormal anymore, Sean, uh, to, to be part of that kind of a life. It's just who I am now, you know? So you started hearing disembodied voices without the mechanism. Absolutely. The oh, no? sure. Oh, sure. I've yeah. heard them before, but I don't hear them constantly. I've heard them on investigations from time to time, maybe yeah. three times in 30 years. Yeah, no, I've developed an acute sensitivity um, over the years, but I've also learned to do basically what my devices have taught me to do, which is I can filter out and I can turn things on and off at will now. It oh, takes wow. a lot. It takes a lot. That's pretty much what a medium would do, you know, but, you know, I've never had an ethereal connection. I've never had a loved one say to me, um, you know, can you help me? You know, I want to reach out to so-and-so or something like that. I've never had that happen. Um, most have been just strange interactions with spirits that I can't see or spirits that I know. I don't know them. So I don't tend to talk to strangers without getting to know someone a little bit. Sure. Uh, you know, it's like anybody else, but no, there's no reason for me to to speak to a spirit, um, you know, that um, takes initiatives to to I don't know uh, maybe uh, the the element of surprise. I mean, I don't really need a spirit coming up to me and saying, "Can you help me?" Uh, they they don't typically do that. Okay, they usually do something else. They'll do something like, uh, "I know what you're thinking about," <laughs> you know, like I'm like, "Yeah, so what?" So, yeah. I, so, you know, hold on, hold still. Let me see if I can hear what you're thinking about, you know? So it's like, you know, you want to listen to my thoughts? Hold on a minute, buddy. I'm going to listen yeah. to your thoughts. All right. Um, and, and that's pretty much how I, that's game I'll play with them, you know? And it is, a, it's kind of a game uh, to me uh, only because I have such an inquisitive mind that I want to take and suck up as much information, absorb as much knowledge as I can in this lifetime. To right. me, I am a firm believer that the things I learn in this lifetime, the wisdom, the knowledge, um, all the insight that I learn, I'm taking with me, okay? And I'll put it to good use from the other side. Right. So, you know, I, I just think of the things that have happened to me as being more of a blessing than a curse. Um, the things that have happened to me have opened the door to opportunities in a good way. That's how I look at life. Um, because there are too many people with blinders in this world that go That's through exactly. their lifetimes, okay, without having an inkling of understanding about unknown commodities and things that exist around us. They just right. have no clue. I'd rather be uh, well informed at least at an ability that makes me feel comfortable with these things uh, in my lifetime. And I think about all the people who, who don't have any, any idea, they can't grasp all these wonderful things. Well, these are, to me, these are life experiences. They're, they're not to be taken lightly, they're mine and I own them. And it's nothing, uh, there's nothing in my life that's happened that I regret. Um, I mean, I obviously the, the changes that happened with Melissa um, are sad and I wouldn't wish it upon anybody, but that was just the course of life that, that I was given. And you have to adapt to that. You, you can't shun yourself away. You can't go into a closet. You can't 
go into a state of depression, you can't become a hermit, you can't, you know, you have to live your life to its fullest because you're doing so in honor and memory of your loved one. You know, you're, you're doing it for them. So in many cases, all these things that I've done, it's for her and it's for everybody else who hasn't experienced the, the great things that, that we've experienced. Uh, there is no other motivation that I have um, other than to, to find a way to bring peace and harmony to, to a lot of people who have been through this kind of trauma. It's, right. you know what I mean? I, I just hope that, that people will see it that way and, um, you know, open their eyes to, to the things that, that matter most. That's all. I, I just wish guys like you and I uh, set the, uh, the rule book for how things are supposed to be conducted yeah. in this field. Um, I had my show back in 2011. It was canceled. Uh, so I've been to the mountaintop. I've seen the puppet strings. And and uh, I've been right back down to the podcast studio and uh, fell on hard times, had great times. I still get the, the uh, great opportunity to go out and talk to young people at schools and stuff about the paranormal. It's been amazing. I just, I love it. And I take your boxes with me everywhere I go and the kids love them, you know, and uh, to see their face light up is, is just amazing. But, uh, you know, it's right now it's, it's so saturated out there, Gare. And uh, the, the, with the television shows and, and all the instant gratification, you got to keep things moving, moving. And I'm not going to say fake not faked, yeah. maybe overreacted to some things in the uh, television shows because you have to have that. I always tell people, you don't want to go watch me investigate the paranormal because unless you want to watch a video paint drawing. Yeah, exactly. You know. I mean, yeah, I, I I think I know where you're headed headed in this. Um, yeah. I, and this may shock a lot of people, but I don't it's watch it. Yeah, I don't watch the shows. Okay. Yeah. Um there's a reason for that. Number one, um, there's so many gadgets and gizmos out there that um, I I don't want to be influenced uh, by anybody else's ideas or thoughts. Okay, right. and I made this I made this comment once before uh, about you know people ask me, well, what's your opinion on this? I, I can't. They talk about a portal and they talk about all these devices and. And I have to tell you, I don't research other people's stuff or look at their stuff. I have no interest in that whatsoever. Know you know, either. my path has been very narrow. There's there's a purpose uh, in in what I do. There's a, a reason behind it. I don't want any extraneous um, influences from other people, their ideas, their thoughts, or even a picture of the products to influence me. And and I don't like. You know the stuff that I have seen. I don't really like it. I don't. I. I don't know what people see in it. I'll be honest with you. You know, I mean, people on the shows. I'm tired of listening to the same stuff. Uh, you know, uh, and that's why I stopped. I'm tired of hearing that uh, everybody get excited over nothing. I'm ti I'm tired of listening to a blip of a sound and then somebody misinterpreting it. Mm -hmm. um, there's just too many things that are wrong with with what's happening out there. You're right. And so why would I waste my time when I know I can fix that? <laughs> okay. My go when I, I got so frustrated watching that, that I'm like, I have to fix this because the people are on the wrong track and it's it's frustrating. I I, I don't get any enjoyment out of it. Uh, watching people suffer. <laughs> We're trying to right. interpret, you know, a silly response. And, you know, especially with, um, you know, EVPs and stuff, it's hard. It's a hardship. In fact, one of the things that, that I was thinking of doing was actually training people, having a school, you know, for those individuals uh, that, that could benefit by using it the most. That'd be amazing. Oh, An online study or something. It's something either, whether it be a Zoom or something, you know, where we just go through a, a study course uh, so that I can tell them what the best settings are. I can show them, hey, there's an EVP mode. You slap a, a line, take the audio out into a line input of a recorder, 
you're going to get some of the clearest EVPs you've ever heard. Okay. Yeah. And we're not even sweeping. So, um, you know, to be able to do that and have clear responses on a silent background is just amazing. And that's that to me will make recorders obsolete because now you can take that those EVPs, you can pick and choose which ones you want, and there'll be a lot. I'm talking like you do a three minute session, you end up with like 10 EVPs. Um, you'll be able to reproduce that on television. People actually will be able to hear it, you know, which is wonderful. You know how sometimes they'll analyze it with a computer and they'll show the waveform and stuff, right? Sure. Yeah. Well, you know, now you can pick and choose the EVPs you want to play back that are relevant, pertinent to the conversation or the investigation. I mean, that's really important. You know, I was I was just thinking, you ever seen those posters of the evolution of man from monkey to the yeah, man? Of course. You know, if, you look at, if you look at your website, mm. over the years, I've looked at it many times, the Pro Measure the yeah. AS website, uh, you can see the evolution of Gary yeah. <laughs> on this website because everything has led up to this new device. Yeah. The IDCX, it's yeah. yeah radio, yes. Radio X is um, well. What happened, Sean? In all honesty, was you know it started off with something very simple, and then um, after spending you know countless hours on first prototype, I then went to another uh, version. I had uh, I developed three prototypes. You know, the first one I put in countless hours, and I learned everything I needed to learn in order to proceed to the next one. So I learned from my mistakes in the first one. And I went, it's, it's pretty much, that is the evolution of creating a product to me. You learn by your mistakes, you then go on to your next and you make it better. I always knew that there would be three prototypes and, and to get to where I wanted to be, it was gonna take, well, it's taken me three years. So uh, I started this well before COVID and you know, I was housebound like everybody else. So I figured, what the heck? I, I can put in all the time I need to. Sure. And by the time I got to the third version, which I now have, there's really nothing else I need to do to it. The only thing I'm, I'm trying to figure out now is it's got so much potential that, um, you know, I, I want to share it with everybody so they can see firsthand before I get into a production mode. There is something that is going to... Um, slow down my production mode, which happens to be availability of some of the key ICs that I use. I only have 36. And oh, no. some of the people that make the ICs that I use, um, you know, like my, uh, my radio IC is used in automotion, automotive cars and trucks and stuff. So um, I'm having a hard time getting that chip. No, oh, no. Uh, yeah, it's made by Silicon Labs. And let me tell you something. Um, I had no idea going into this that we would be confronted with, you know, this uh, in incredible um, situation with uh, inventory. So, you know, you, you've heard all the horror stories about, you know, cars, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of cars, you know, missing certain ICs and chips. Oh, um, yeah you know, this product, you know, has the same type of situation. So I have 36 and th there'll be some lucky people out there if they, <laughs> if they get one. Yeah. Um, but so don't worry, Sean, you, you'll be on the list. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, I have um, the third prototype. I learned everything I needed to do and, and I feel it's strong. And, and I've even been able to, uh, use one frequency, meaning I would just tune in to a frequency and through offsets and overlapping some of the, the um, you know, the frequencies within that station, I'm able to get speech, <laughs> speech from spirits coming through without sweeping, which is remarkable. And uh, I demonstrated this not too long ago at the office to uh, Sean Austin. He stopped by and I said, hey, I got to show you this, man. This is this was like my first prototype. I said, here's where I'm at. Okay. And we tuned in and it was a little bit, a little weak, but we could both make it out. We were talk they were talking to us about heaven and, you know, that, that they were dead and, you know, help us. And all this was coming through one static frequency. And I'm like, okay, this is 
one of the things that I would learn. How do I improve on that? So when I went from prototype one to prototype three, I figured out a way to even make it stronger and clearer. And those are the things that that um, enabled me to get to this, this point. I mean, it's like the learning experience is very gratifying and, and satisfying, you know, to, what to do you think they're drawing energy from if, when it's not scanning like that, just the white noise, the, the, there's no noise. There's no noise. Yeah. There's no noise. They, um, I, you know, from, yeah, from my, yeah, it's, it's quite remarkable. Um, because, and I posted some of them on, on Twitter as well. Some of the recordings, you know, spirits, you know, they were elated, they were excited. Some of them are very strong you know, they're like, man, this, this may work. Gary, this may work good. We're, you hear us? I hear myself. You know, it's like, oh my gosh. It's like, those are the kinds of comments I was getting from spirits, you know? Right. Uh, so that was exciting. Um, I knew that, I always knew that was there, but that takes a certain amount of spirit. Um, it, I mean, you, you can sense from their enthusiasm that they were excited by by that one approach to communication, because it it's not hasn't been done before. You know, I mean, it has been done before. I've been told that other people have done it in, in time, but for the most part, we don't know about that. There's nothing current right now um, that I'm aware of where spirits are coming through one frequency very clearly. Um, so that's exciting. And I was talking to Chris uh, Fleming about it and he's like, you know, we've discussed that many, many times over the years, you know, to be able to accomplish something like that. And I, I became aware of it uh, accidentally just by one of my devices starting up and sweeping and then stopping. It literally just stopped at a certain frequency by itself. And a voice started coming through and talking to me. So it was almost as if either they moved it to that frequency and they wanted to show me what they could do. I have no idea who did that. It could have been Melissa. It could have been a spirit. I don't know who did it. All I know is they brought me to a frequency and it stopped on the frequency. And I'm like, oh, for crying out loud, what did I just do? You know, and I'm trying to adjust it. And all of a sudden they started talking to me and I clicked with them. You know, so it's almost like an accidental accomplishment in some sense, because it just kind of like it happened by mistake. Right. To be honest with you. And then once I realized that it could be done, then I started focusing on ways to improve on it. Uh, but a lot of the things that I've done, too, have been trial and error. But a lot of them, Sean, in all honesty, happened. And I don't even know how it happened. It just happened. It's like. It's like a mistake that I would like you make a mistake, but then that mistake works out to be something really beneficial. And right. uh, I've had a lot of those happen in developing uh, this product. So uh, I may have had some help from above. I don't know. Uh, I've had a lot of a lot of spirit comments over the stuff, you know, commenting on my electronics prowess and being able to accomplish things and yesterday or day before i had one say that you're really an expert with this equipment and uh you know stuff like that and you you listen to it you don't know if i don't know if they're trying trying to be a wise wise guy or something like oh, he's an expert at at this you know right. are they are, what are they trying to say are they insinuating something that i'm not really understanding or are they being sincere you don't really know because it's just a comment you know that you hear but, I like it. I mean, I, it keeps me busy. It's never boring. Anyone who has a radio XITC will sit down with it and probably sit down with it a lot longer than they should. Okay. Because it's addicting. It's more addicting than any other device that I've ever used. Um, and, you know, to have a menu driven system, an index yeah. and a menu to be able to go through and select all the parameters and make all these subtle adjustments. Um, I think everybody will find a configuration that works best for them. And then they'll take that configuration and I can see feedback being shared among paranormal investigators or ITC researchers. Like 
this is the configuration that I get really great responses on. And then someone will say, well, I've done that too, but I've got this adjustment set for number seven. You have it set for number three. You know, let's try it at number seven, you know? And really that's what it comes down to. So when you go into my index, I have numbers. Right. So you may say, okay, signal strength is at seven. Um, reverb is at three. Uh, reverb strength is at two. Um, you know, A and C filter is at, you know, minus 20 dB. Um, you know, so you can go through and you can actually come up with a con configuration profile and you can save it. So if you find what works for you, you simply store your configuration in memory. And then when you come back to it, it's right there for you. But let me tell you what the whole game, the game changer was for, for communication with the device. Let me tell you the biggest thing I learned. And this has always been something that's been on everybody's mind. And that is... Where do responses originate while you're sweeping? And I always, I always get irked by people who rip out my antennas, okay, from my devices. I mean, they have their reasons, you know, I totally get it. All right. They, they, they don't, they don't want any radio bits in interfering, but what they, what they don't understand is the importance and an open mind that radio bits also provide strength and nourishment to the responses that come through. So I've been able to prove, and I just found a lot of it last night as well, through rewinding a very simple radio station with words. In one case, going from a radio station with words to rewinding it and having a completely set of different responses embedded within those words. And so what, what I found is that the strongest radio frequencies yield the best responses. And in order to have strong responses, you need good reception. So what the Radio X, once I've determined that to be true, through analysis and replaying and stuff like that, and seeing how they modify and manipulate some of these frequencies. Um, I entered a feature into the device that allowed me to hand select what frequencies I want the device to sweep. Once, so I start at the beginning, 88, right? And this only does FM, by the way. So you're going to go from 88 to 108. And I go online and I find where all the radio stations are in my area, the strongest ones. Now there's there's a, actually a lookup table online, so anybody can look up uh, what stations are strongest in their area. And um, I did it manually. The first time I went through every single frequency and I wrote them all down. Okay, this one is great, this one's not. So what I do is let's say that we have a really incredible talk radio station on 88.5. So what I'll do is the cool thing about Radio X is it doesn't sweep uh, in 100 kilohertz steps. I can sweep in 10 kilohertz steps. So instead of it being 88.5, 88.6, I may want to select 88.01, 88.02, 88.03. These are little tiny increments for sweeping. And so every radio out there, every sweep radio out there is, you know, are, taking 100 kilohertz steps. So I, I decided that by breaking them down into smaller increments, they overlap with each other. And by overlapping and blending the frequencies, it enables the spirit to elongate and add more words to their vocabulary. So instead of a sharp cutoff, if you're sweeping and you get a great station, you know, a rock station at 102.1, and then at 102.2, it's gone. Well, what I do is I drag that through. So I'll go in, I'll select 102.1, and then I'll do a little bit on the roll off. I'll do 102.11, 102.12, 102.13. So what I'm doing, I'm taking the leading and trailing edges of that frequency, and I'm taking snippets of that. So mm -hmm. now I've got a smooth transition leading up to over and on the other side of the, the leading key frequency that is generating the music or the talk. 
What that does is that adds an incredible amount of time and nourishment to spirit to blend and, and manipulate the frequency. Now, all other frequencies, I'm ignoring 100%. The noise, the chatter, the scatter, the, you know, the fuzz, the white noise, all that crap is gone. So now it's just blended frequencies. And let me tell you, Sean, they go nuts for those frequencies. Yeah. Nope. Nobody's figured that out yet. It's a very simple thing to figure out. You know, everybody's like, you know, what, you know, I'd like to be able to know what frequency I'm getting response on so I can go back to it. Well, this, this solves that problem. And this is one of the reasons why I'm getting such powerful responses. But the other thing that I've done is I've included some automation uh, with Radio XITC. And what I mean by that is I can sweep through all my frequencies. And if I hear a response, Within milliseconds, I'm reversing and going back and then sweeping back and forth over the hot spot. Ten second intervals, yeah. Well, no, what I do is it, if I go through that rock station and I see and I hear I'm dead and you're sweeping, I stop instantly and I go back to the 102.1 and I'll sweep over that 102.1 three times, three consecutive times, and then I'll continue on to the next frequency. So I'll always go back to the previous frequency to make sure if a spirit wanted to talk in that spot, I want to go back to that spot and give him a chance to resume where he left off. Right. Mm. So that's one of the things, key things that, that I'm trying to, to do with this. I want to enable them, give them the ability to be heard more clearly. Uh, it, it adds just more power to them. I want to give, I want to empower them with opportunity to be able to be heard and not skip by something that cuts them off in the middle of two words. So what we're finding out today is it's less about the scan and more about the frequency. Absolutely. It's more about the strength of the frequency, the type, whether it be a talk radio. If you are blending music frequencies in, um, you're going to end up with a little bit of harmonics, a little bit of, um, you'll hear their voice, but it'll be mixed and blended with the actual a guitar, maybe a, a tone from a guitar or something like that. You'll hear right. the voice in there. Okay, but what, what you want essentially is uh, clear talk types of stations. They work the best. I've never seen anything yield the best. Now, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. If you, the, if you are not sharp at your skill, if you're not a skilled ITC person and you're unable to separate a radio bit from a spirit response, then my suggestion to that individual would be, well, sharpen your skills. It's mm -hmm. like learning a new language. You know, don't take, don't take and start ripping the, the product apart because you're trying to, to solve a problem. That's not a way to solve the problem. The way to solve the problem is, is to become more connected with the skill set and learn how to utilize that to your advantage. A lot right. of people just, you know, jump to conclusions without opening their mind to other ways of dealing with certain issues. Um, I've never, I've always used FM. I've never used AM. So when I tackled the Radio X, I decided, well, FM works. Why? And it's been the best possible way, the smoothest, the cleanest, the, the, the quietest way of interpreting the responses. So I'm not going to deviate from that. I was going to stay focused. I don't care what anybody said to me. Do you think when running like the um, PSB 11, the ANC, the one I have here, mm -hmm. do you think when running this, is it better to run both channels, channel one and two together? with one going forward, one in reverse, or just work off one channel, you know, and try it that way. Is that now yeah. that we know more about frequency and, and less yeah. scan? Well, the, the first thing I do with Radio X, uh, or if I do with, with uh, any spirit box, I make sure I got clean and clear reception wherever I go. Uh, my building is all metal at the shop. So if I'm going to test, if somebody sends something in, to have it checked out or whatever, I always test it next to a, a window, you know, um, and by my workbench where I do all my development, 
I actually have a plug-in antenna that goes outside. It's attached to the outside of the steel building mm -hmm. so that I can get some reception. Otherwise, I can't really test it very well. But with in, the best way to do that is I typically scan around 200 to 250 milliseconds. I used to scan faster. So 200 is going to scan 5, 250 is going to scan 4 frequencies per second. So I typically like to um, sweep Slow. into FM, and I usually sweep at that level. And when you, one of the things that you don't want to do is you don't want to have too much volume because that A and C circuit is connected with the internal speakers. So it's not connected with the audio outputs. So what you want to do is, and those speakers are good and they're powerful. Plus the A and C also has um, the 386 amplifier that I use uh, amplifies the volume up considerably. So it, the best advice I, I tell people when you're setting it up, I, I ship it. I do all the hand calibration myself on those. Anybody that gets one, um, I test it thoroughly before it shipped out. So I get frustrated when somebody says to me, oh, you know, the ANC doesn't work, but, but I know it worked because I, I did it personally. Uh, but the, the thing about it is if you were to reset that by pressing the up and down arrows in the back for channel one, channel two, when you turn on your device, you don't want to, to increase the volume more than one or two clicks. There is a range of operation for that, and you don't want to exceed the range of operation of the noise filter. So some people will click up the volume like five clicks, and that thing is really loud, and you can't make out anything when you have a distorted sound. So the, if you can find a nice, comfortable level um, and that's why I say a couple, one or two clicks is all you need to hear a spirit response. Adjust your filter accordingly. You want just on the strongest stations in your area, you're going to hear just a little bit of a zap, a little, ch -ch, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. If a spirit's there, it's going to come through. If it's not there, then there, it's not, nothing's going to happen. But I use FM 200, 250 is uh, pretty much what I use. FM all the time. I don't care if you sweep forward, reverse. I sweep forward only because people say they sweep backward because it proves it's not a radio bit. Well, my my head can prove it's not a radio bit. Sure, okay. sure. And if you're really in tune and sync with your work or the type of work, the ITC work that you're doing, you should be able to figure that out. And if you can't, then you need more practice. That, I mean, practice, practice, and practice some more, you know, until you get yeah. it straight. Now, Gary, you've mentioned in the past, my friend, and I've seen on Twitter, and you spoke about out-of-body or astral projection, mm. that Melissa has allowed you to go with her and even meet her boyfriend. Oh, yeah. Oh, Can I you go that. into that? Yeah, yeah. Let me talk to you about that. Um, okay, so uh, I've had a number of um, astral experiences. The, the the first couple and at first off astral astral experience or an astral voyage is when you're literally taken from one realm your consciousness uh, is uh, extracted and carried to another realm and you're basically coexisting uh, in in a conscious state of being in another environment okay it's uh, a little bit different than out of body experience. Well, it's quite a bit. All of my astral projections have been uh, in the hereafter. Okay. Meaning I've been privy to be able to see, feel, and sense everything uh, in heaven, um, at least three times, maybe four times. So, in one instance, I was uh, in it, you know, I was in a normal dream. A normal dream is just a normal thing that we all experience on, on a, most of us experience. Um, and I felt an interruption of that dream. It's the interruption. It's almost as if, how can I put it? You're, you're in a car, a, a family, family trip as a kid, you're in the back seat, you fall asleep and then you wake up and you're in a different location. Like, wow, you know, two hours went by in blink of an eye, literally, right? right? So 
we've all experienced that, you know, um, as you sleep, you lose track of time and so on and so forth. Well, the surprise that you have when you wake up and you realize you're at a new destination or you're in a plane, you fall asleep and you hear the pilot suddenly say, oh, you know, buckle your seatbelts, we're landing, you know, and, and uh, you're, you're there and, and uh, geez, I just, I was just in California and stark reality is you're in another location. So it, uh, astro travel is kind of like that, you know, um, in one minute you're having a dream and then suddenly it's flipping a page and you find yourself bewildered in a new environment. And in this one instance where I met Melissa and her boyfriend, I had been talking to her out loud, as I often do, and I expressed myself to her and I said, she would be really nice. I mean, it'd be really nice if I understood a little bit more about heaven, about the hereafter. You know, like, is it just, a, are you living a normal life? You know, do you have a husband? Do you have children? Do you have a, a boyfriend? You know, what are some of the things that you do? Do you eat food? You know, like, do you live in a house? All the things that a lot of people wanted to know. All right. And I asked her those questions. I said, Mel, I'd really appreciate if you can tell daddy or show daddy some some point, you know, what, what it's like. And uh, I have to just refrain a little bit because this, when you have these kinds of experiences, they, they leave you with such a deep emotional, um, it's like a scar that just, it's, it's, but it's a good scar. You know, it's like, man, it's a battle wound and I earned it, you know, but it, mm -hmm. it always makes me feel a little choked up when I, when I refer to it. But what happened was um, I was in a dream and suddenly I found myself standing in a neighborhood. The, the best way for me to describe this neighborhood would be um, back in my era, it'd be like Leave it to Beaver or, you know, like a Brady Bunch or something like that. It was oh, wow. just a beautiful residential street. There were willow trees uh, on both sides. They literally created a canopy uh, above, above where I was standing. And they lined the entire street from, from, from as far as I could see. There were manicured lawns, beautiful homes with gardens in the front. There were flowers um, carefully bordering all of the landscaped around the front steps, around the sidewalk, pavers. It was just meticulously maintained and just beautiful. I mean, the colors were exquisite. So I'm standing there and all of a sudden I hear, hi, daddy. And I, oh man. And I turn around and here's Melissa, you know, uh, just like, just like we were talking, just like she never left. I mean, it was like she had this big smile on her face and um, she came running over to me and gave me a big hug. Mm. And we started talking and I'm like, Mel, this is absolutely amazing. I said, I'm looking around. She goes, how do you like it, daddy? And I says, this heaven, she goes, part of it. Mm. So it, it was like, you know, she's, it was part of heaven. And um, so, it, you know, she was smiling. We were talking a little bit and, and I'm like, you know, how did I get here? She, she told me that she could bring me to heaven. She could show me if she wanted to, <clears throat> excuse me. And, um, so then as I'm facing her, my back is to the other end of the street. And she goes, daddy, there's, there's somebody that I'd like you to meet. And, uh, she go and she, she smiled and she looked behind me. And as I turn around, I see this gentleman <clears throat> walking from a convenience store, like a little mom and pop five and dime store across the street. And he's walking towards me and he's carrying a tray. And I'm like, what's, what's going on? She goes, daddy, you've got to taste this soup 
And I'm like, what? <laughs> so <laughs> and the guy com comes up to me. He goes, um, hi, Mr. Galka. Uh, it's a pleasure to meet you. I'm so-and-so. And, -so. and uh, he hands me the soup. And Melissa goes, Dad, you, Daddy, you got to try this. So I tasted the soup. Sean, I tasted that freaking soup. Yeah. It was like like the best soup I've ever had in my life. I'm, and I look at Mel, I'm like, this is incredible. This is delicious. I'm tasting soup. Mel, I'm in heaven. I'm tasting soup. And she laughed. She actually laughed. So your taste buds were working. I mean, you my were taste buds were working just fine. Okay. And so I, I, I looked at her, I tasted the soup. Uh, I met her. I have to assume it was her boyfriend because he shook my hand and uh, he smiled. Good looking guy. So Melissa's got good taste and mm -hmm. I'm glad Melissa found somebody that, that loves her and she loves him. And, um, and I, after I tasted the soup, I, I remember Mel smiling back and then I felt myself being pulled. Mm -hmm. Whenever I, whenever it's time to leave, it's like an uncontrolled uh, knee jerk or a reflex. You don't really have a choice. It's not like you're saying, hey man, I'm staying, <laughs> you know, I'm yeah. not going back. You know, you don't have that option. And I felt something closing. That's all I can say is I just felt like a light that was around me. And then all of a sudden the light uh, compresses and there's this, a little dot of light and then you open up your eyes in bed. Right. So that's pretty much how it went. And, you know, when those experiences happen, you know, the first thing I do is I wake up my wife and I, I'm like, man, I got to just tell you, this is like one of the most amazing things that just happened. I just sure. saw Mel, I was in heaven um, and I met her boyfriend. And of course, to a, a person who can't comprehend or understand any of what I just shared with you, they're going to think I'm, I'm, I'm nuts. So... You know, for those of you who don't believe, it's like, you know, I guess I'd be in the same boat uh, unless I experienced it firsthand. And and that's, that's amazing, Gary. Pretty much how it was. Um, and when you're having this, and you're in that moment, my daughter Addie, she's 13 years old. Yeah, I can't imagine standing there with her in this beautiful area, meeting this young man, eating this soup, and all of a sudden being pulled back away i i don't know what I, I don't know if i could get out of bed and go to work brother yeah. you know i would be so i would want to stay in that moment well i i think yeah part of it is i i know that euphoric feeling um because i've felt it before and and you don't want to leave and the funny thing about it is that when you're in that moment you really you're willing to give everything up it's a strange feeling because the 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 feeling of love and um, the things that the emotional connection that you have at that point in time is something that you've never felt. It's it's um, you know I don't do drugs, but if I ever did a, dr a drug, I would certainly want to make me feel like that. Um, but every single time I've had an experience like that, I wish it would never end, ever. Right. And, you know, I was willing, it's such an incredible feeling that you're willing to leave everybody behind. It's that good. You know, it's like you hear about, you. Re, I often read stories uh, from other people who've had experience in, and they've seen heaven and they don't mm -hmm. want to go back either. Right. You no, know? I mean, it's that wonderful. So it it's given me a glimpse. That was one, one case in point. And then another time, um, I was pulled out, pulled out of a dream the same way. And I found myself standing inside of a cavern or a cave, like a cave environment on top, on top of a very high mountain range area. And at one end, I could see an opening, a jagged opening that just, you know, if you looked out, you could see clouds and blue sky and colors. I couldn't see the ground. It was just sky that I could see. And 
I'm standing there, and again, I'm totally confused, but I know what happened to me. One thing for sure is you're very much aware of what has actually happened to you. You just don't know what's going to happen next. Sorry. So, you know, that's the surprising part. So while I'm standing there, I hear, you know, like clip, clop, clip, clop, you know, like, like, like steps coming toward me, like an echo on a long ha hallway somewhere in an empty building or a gym where nobody else is in there. And around the corner comes Melissa. Yeah. And, uh, you know, she's smiling and she gives me a big hug. And when you get these hugs, you feel the physical body. It's not like an air hug. Okay. This Mel always was the best at giving uh, good hugs. So, I think that when I was able to to do that, then the next next thing was for her to, you know, take this experience to the next level, which was to to show me something important. And she said, she said to me, she goes, Daddy, I, I want to show you something. So she brought me over to the edge of this cliff. Right. And all I could see are, you know valleys and lakes and streams and green pastures and flowers and trees and just endless sky with with just beauty everywhere you could look and she says hold my hand and i held her hand and off the cliff we went and we started soaring literally soaring um through all these beautiful uh scenic locations together and as we did uh, she said, look down, daddy. And Sean, there, there was like a million animals and they're all like looking up at me and, and they were in pairs. I mean, they were like two of, of all of these different animals together. And this seemed to go on for, I don't know, maybe 15, 20 seconds, 30 seconds. I don't know. I had no time, but again, I felt the disconnection starting to happen. And I grabbed her by the wrist. I said, I don't want this to end. And she squeezed my hand three times, just gave me a squeeze, squeeze three times. I love you. Three words. And um, I op open my eyes in bed. Again, the, the window closes. I see a little speck of light and then boop, open your eyes. That's amazing, Gary. Yeah. I had had one one experience where Melissa was not in it. And that experience was kind of, was really very awesome. Um, I was brought to this beautiful meadow and this meadow had flowers. There were children, at least a half a dozen, maybe more children playing with two or three adults observing them. Uh, the women had sundresses on. It was a beautifully clear day uh, to my right or in front of me, uh, there was a, it was like, uh, yeah. it was like uh, clouds and there was like a, a big waterfall coming out of the clouds. Right. And, and it was going into a gorge, which had no bottom. And there were angelic beings floating uh, above the mist of this waterfall. And there was a girl about five feet off to my side, sitting on a blanket, Be you know, beautiful girl with a sundress, just sitting there, blonde hair, didn't recognize her at all. And uh, I stood up once I realized what my surroundings were like. And I looked at her and I said, I know where I am. And she didn't really say anything to me. She kind of like just nodded her head. And I walked to the edge of the cliff. And I looked at her. And I said, I know what I can do. And she smiled at me and I turned around and I took a leap of faith and I just walked off the cliff. Mm. And when I walked off the cliff, I didn't fall. I began to float almost like remote control. I was totally out of control. I had no control over this whole thing. I started floating out to the middle of the gorge. I looked down, I couldn't see any bottom water i could feel the mist from this waterfall and then when i got to the center it stopped and i started going into a prone position on my back straight out almost like i was being laid out and when i did that i looked up and i saw an incredible white light 
and the white light was swirling just in a big circle. And I describe it as being like a tornado upside down. It had a funnel effect. So what I saw was a big white light and it came in and it came to a sharp point at the very end where it just disappeared. And I started going up towards the white light. When that happened, Sean, I believed I had died in my sleep. And I kept going up more and I, I, I'm, I'm thinking this now, I'm like, okay, Lord, I, I guess I, I've passed, I'm ready for heaven. And this is how it's gonna end. Boom, open your eyes in bed, just like that. That was it. I fell asleep that, I fell asleep right afterwards and it was just beginning to get a little bit light and outside. I fell asleep and boom, I'm right back there again. Same spot, identical spot. There were no angelic beings. There are no children playing. There's no beautiful woman sitting in a sundress on a, on a blanket in the grass. Uh, the gorge was there. The waterfall was there. And after I looked and, and said, why did I come back here? It dawned on me. It was proof of the experience that I had just gone through, that it exists. And somebody wanted me to see it twice. So there it was. I'd have, I've never had an event where you wake up from it and then you're thrown right back in the same location again. Never. It was remarkable. Mark Never God. anything scary or fearful out there. I, was, I know some people have came on the show in the past, astral projection and stuff. They've ran into others they didn't feel comfortable around, to say the least. No, all my all of my astral projections um, were really beautiful experiences. Um, my out of body experience, Mel had to intervene on one of my out of body experiences and literally bring me back to the house. She grabbed me by the hand and brought me back. Uh, that was the only thing that I would say, she may have looked at my well-being as being um, maybe a little bit um, beyond what she would consider to be safe. I mean, I came out of my body, um, thoughts projected me to go out through the house, out through the front wall. I went down about uh, 300 feet to the edge of the road near a big oak tree. And I just wanted to keep going because the feeling was so strong. But then I felt a window open up and I felt Melissa's presence. Then I felt her grab my hand and turn me around. She then brought me back to the house. And I was just ast astonished by that experience. I could not see her, which means she was in a completely different place. Um, I was just local. I was just like in the environment itself, in my yard, but I was out of body. And so she basically came, pushed me through the, the window in the back of the house, went over the water garden that I had created for her. And that was it. I opened my eyes in bed and, and that was that. But I'll tell you, if you've never had an out-of-body experience, one of the most memorable things or an astral, astral visitation, it's one of the most amazing things anybody could go through in life. And I, again, that kind of like just adds to my knowledge and experiences and, and the things that I've learned. It's just been a wonderful learning experience. Wow. What an amazing interview. What an amazing person. And the research keeps going on and on. And I cannot wait to see what he's going to come up with next. I can't. I love using his stuff in the field. I even have the, uh, I have it right here, the spirit box. The uh, PSB 11 A and C audio noise control that I use constantly. So I've been probably going to use it up here in the studio. We're going to use it a couple times here uh, in studio, live on the air, see what we can get. I'm going to get some more uh, equipment too. we we'll get the REM pods. I, I probably have three or four different spirit boxes. You never know which one's going to work. It seems like on, on a different nights, different environments, uh, you have different types of communication going on with these different types of boxes. That's something maybe Gary should look into also. So anyway, guys, you hear the music. Special thanks to tonight's guest, my friend, Gary Galka of DAS and of course, ProMeasure.com. Of course, the creator of numerous devices used in the field of spirit research. 
Remember, you can catch this episode and all the rest on all Shadow Nation podcast social media sites. And of course, YouTube at, at Shadow Nation Podcast. That's Shadow Na- at Shadow Nation Podcast. And the website, ShadowNation.com. Don't forget to click the button below, like, and subscribe, or you won't miss any upcoming episodes. From the haunted back roads of America, this has been another exclusive Shadow Nation interview. Don't go change in America. You know I won't, because I love you. Good night, everybody.